Hello, and welcome to Bold Conversations, a five-part series on the Immune Deficiency Foundation podcast aimed at advancing knowledge and understanding of health equity. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Bold Conversations, our special content for the IDF podcast, where we delve into topics related to health inequities and health equity. I am thrilled as your host today to bring you an amazing expert, Dr. Jay Bott. Dr. Bott is a primary care internist and geriatrician committed to care delivery innovation and advancing health equity. And Dr. Bott is also the managing director at Deloitte and has done a lot of work around uh, the financial implications of health inequities. Dr. Bott, thank you so much for being here. And I'd love for you to start out by just giving us a little more information and background about who you are and how you became interested in health inequities and how you ended up at Deloitte. Thank you so much, Dr. Rochester. It is uh, an honor to be here and I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you and appreciate just the tremendous work you and uh, the team at Immune Deficiency Foundation have been doing uh, on this issue and lifting it up. Uh, it's certainly uh, personal and professional for me. Uh, I'm the son of two South Asian immigrants. Uh, my mom, a factory worker, my dad, a pharmacist on the South side of Chicago for most of his life. And I uh, got up close and, and sort of frontline view to the challenges uh, faced by uh, people of color, particularly uh, the black community who uh, was uh, struggling uh, with the ability to um, look after their day-to-day -day life, their health and uh, their family. Uh, and we know that the drivers of health, um, access to fresh, uh, affordable, healthy food, to housing that may be, um, impacting health outcomes to transportation, deserts to just um, isolation and, and lack of connection, and then the wealth health gap, um, which is uh, important too. And so that uh, really sparked my initial interest in asking the questions about why certain populations face uh, more of an uphill climb uh, to get to uh, the ability to have health and opportunity um, and thrive. And so I continued along that journey and. Uh, uh, ended up working with some doctors who put a clinic in the back end of a barber shop to meet black men where they were at in Chicago, and that um, helped illuminate, you know, opportunities to, that if we meet people where they're at, help them in their journey with people requiring different supports uh, um, along their journey, that we could actually uh, make an impact. And this community uh, started changing how they engage in health. Uh, they became more educated, they made different decisions, they started helping each other get jobs. And so when you had economic mobility, that that had an impact on health. And so that became kind of you know, my uh, inspiration for calling of I want a doctor in underserved communities as a vehicle for social change. It was historically marginalized, historically vulnerable, historically underserved. And I want to uh, collaborate with communities uh, to help them change their future. Uh, and uh, that has been sort of my North Star uh, over my career and had the fortunate opportunity to do that in public health, in clinical um, uh, care, in uh, hospitals and health systems around the country, and in health plans that care uh, for uh, the historically marginalized and underserved and, and, then, and working with the safety net. And so that led me you know, to an opportunity at Deloitte where Deloitte uh, started a health equity institute was investing in this issue around health equity in a meaningful way, trying to advance uh, work uh, related to health equity in the market with clients. And um, we also were seeing that, you know, given the illum inequities illuminated by COVID, the murder of George Floyd, the social unrest, the business had uh, the opportunity to lean in and have a leadership role on addressing health equity, uh, along with healthcare organizations and some of them being uh, large employers as well. Uh, we recently released a report about employers um, playing uh, a role to spark healthy aging. But this piece around cost of health inequities that we released last summer uh, was really tremendous in that it um, painted a picture of that the work around health equity is not just a moral imperative, but is an economic imperative. And then if you lean into health equity, you can create better outcomes and create value as well. And so we said that um, through our analysis, 
Then equities currently cost the U.S. healthcare system approximately $320 billion, looking at five common conditions. Uh, and if left unchecked, the cost of health and equities could reach $1 trillion or more in 2040. We say it's, health equity is not trending towards a crisis. We're in a crisis mode now. We've got to act now. Um, and so by quantifying law and race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, and gender uh, inequities along those five conditions, we're able to get to this um, assessment uh, quantitatively uh, and know that that's just likely a, a lower number than what um, if we take into account delayed diagnosis, uh, ambulatory sensitive conditions, mental health uh, costs which then um, Daniel Dawes at the Satcher Institute at that time released um, a piece in September of last year quantifying the cost of mental health inequities. So um, the other important thing I'll just end with is saying by being able to quantify the impact that these inequities have on healthcare costs, understand the magnitude of it, there are implications of those costs for everyone in society. So it's a thousand for every American today, a 3,000 for every American 2040. When you think about a family of four, that is considerable, 4,000. And twelve thousand, respectively. So um, we've we've got to act now, and the drivers of health, social determinants, systemic and structural issues are important. But then there's also the clinical domains of bias, you know, in the day to day that uh, I and my colleagues um, see and experience uh, when we care for patients and families. Wow, thank thank you for that. That was so comprehensive, and I I first want to just say thank you and compliment you. Your career trajectory is. You know, it's really amazing, and it's a testament to how our purpose can align with our professional goals and aspirations, and uh, the work that you've done is just so incredibly impactful, so I do want to thank you for that. I, I want to unpack some of what you just shared with us, because that was such a great high-level summary of the findings of this landmark report that Deloitte published last summer. And you you started to talk about, well, first I want to reiterate, you said 320 billion with a B, right? So yes, 320 sure. billion with a B today. Yes. Uh, I want to make sure our yes. audience heard that. Um, because as you said, Dr. Bot, this is certainly this is a moral imperative. And that honestly, in and of itself, should be enough for us to take concerted uh action. Um, however, as you said, this goes even beyond that. You know, this goes beyond the moral imperative. It goes beyond the the lives that are lost, the lives that are impacted. But there are significant financial implications, and I think that as Deloitte and others have brought that to light, I, I feel like I'm starting to see a little more groundswell uh, among the business community, among some of our healthcare industry partners, with regard to um, true efforts to begin to tackle this issue. Um, but when it comes to the numbers that you stated and the impact, can you help the audience understand how these health inequities impact everyone? You talked about you know, 1,000 today uh, per patient. Can you help us understand where those numbers come from and, and how we cannot, if we don't identify with one of these marginalized communities how this is information is still important and how this impacts everyone. Yeah, I, one, let me just say thank you for your kind words. Appreciate um, uh, what you um, shared. And I think I would say that this is, um, health equity is everyone's business. And I think it's gonna take a team effort. It's gonna take stakeholders across the continuum um, in uh, industries across uh, our society uh, to advance this issue. Uh, but certainly there are uh, actions we can take today. There's strategic uh, groundwork we can we can certainly put forward um, to advance this work. And so what we um, did is uh, we took a look at uh, the common conditions that impact uh, people that have high costs. So uh, breast cancer, diabetes, colorectal cancer, asthma, and heart disease, and then calculated the percentage of spending attributable, attributable to health inequities across um, race, ethnicity, gender inequities in place. And so, uh, for example, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services of some minority health says that black adults are 60% more likely than white adults to be diagnosed with diabetes and two to three times more likely to have complications. 
So then you you take that when you add those added costs, some of, amount of those added costs are due to bias in equity. We estimated the, that portion to be 4.8% of US annual spending on diabetes for nearly 60 billion annually. So that's how we started building out in each of these conditions, uh, then the costs with having some assumptions. Another is uh, people living the, below the federal poverty level are more than 50% more likely to have asthma than people earning higher incomes. And those disparity driven costs equate to 4.3% of total spending on asthma, equivalent to 2.4 billion a year. And then you take it um, uh, by population. Uh, and we had put out a report about bending the cost curve saying that healthcare spending is rising at a compound annual growth of 5.3%, while spending due to health inequities is rising at 6.2%. And um, that could be driven down if we address these to the like 3.6%. Now, this piece about how everyone is impacted uh, is interesting because we took, if we're saying that inequities account for approximately 320 billion in annual healthcare spending, and we talk about the population in the U.S. that equates to a thousand per capita for health citizen in the U.S. That's you think about kind of this uh, health inequities tax. Um, every ta everyone in every industry stakeholder healthcare system we are paying for it through uh, various uh, mechanisms of tax or other uh, uh, other um, contributions. And so, you know, for all of us, there's a, a benefit. Um, to addressing the economic burden that inequities have uh, on individuals in the country. So um, we, uh, I think, have, have made a pretty compelling case, you know, in this paper around that and say that there are a number of actions, you know, that we can take um, to address this. Now, this is the first report um, that's looked at it in this way in, in quite a while. Uh, and then we've had a number of reports since then that have built on this framework and work. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for um, explaining that for the audience. And I, I want to also circle back because you've mentioned social drivers a few times and you've talked about um, the, you know, the fact that there are people that have different outcomes based on where they live. We know that your zip code is, is much more important than your genetic code in the United States, at least as it relates to health outcomes. Um, and so I'm hoping that you and I can briefly have a conversation that, that just explains to the audience why that is true. Um, so maybe if you just take asthma as an example, can you explain why uh, your socioeconomic status, your race, your ethnicity, where you live, why is that um, impacted or why does that impact asthma? Just just as an example. Sure. sure. I, asthma is a good one. And, and again, it impacts you know, all of the areas that we uh, looked at in our report, but I'll give you a, an example uh, related to asthma even from my clinic. So I could see a patient, you know, who has asthma or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder and uh, say, okay, they will benefit from these clinical treatments. Now people go back to the conditions that make them sick. So I could give them the treatment, they go back to an environment that has mold, that has environmental triggers, that has a carbon footprint, that has uh, industrialization. Or, um, that all can then impact their well-being and their ability to breathe and live a healthy life and manage and control their asthma. So I'm, we're doing everything right clinically, they, you know, yet they're coming back uh, without their symptoms addressed. Um, and they're in the emergency room, or they're coming back for clinical visits, which means that they have to take time off of work, or they have to deal with child care, or a number of other hosts of complexities, you know, that may exist in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, so that's one example. Transportation may even become another problem, the ability to get to clinic. Now with virtual and digital, you know, we're able to mitigate for some of that, but there are some circumstances in which virtual and digital um, uh, may not uh, uncover the full extent of the condition, but also it's um, still addressing the downstream issue without addressing the upstream issue of the communities and environments people live in. And so you've got to say uh, what's going on here and, and try to, it has an impact on cost. So, I mean, I may see someone who has a headache, but if I don't ask them about their housing situation, are they living in the basement? 
or, or their work situation, are they exposed to mold, dust, or other triggers, then I won't understand that that's maybe leading to their headache and allergic uh, uh, condition that's then causing the symptoms or um, triggering their chronic condition of asthma, COPD to flare up, which then uh, is creating a, a downstream domino effect, but doesn't require a CT scan necessarily, um, but may start with addressing those symptomatic challenges and working with a tenant's rights organization to help them with the landlord to address their housing situation or their uh, working with their employer on the work uh, environment and mitigating for some of that mask or other other things we can do. So, you know, now you're seeing healthcare delivery partner with community-based organizations and other stakeholders. So then once you screen for someone who may have a, a driver of health that's impacting their uh, day-to-day life and, and symptoms and, and condition, that then you connect them with services that may help uh, address that. So 80% of the outcomes that we have um, are related to dr- the social drivers of health, environmental, economic, um, whereas 20% is related to, to access and clinical care. When we look at rare diseases, over 300 million people around the world are living with rare disease. Um, 72% of those rare diseases are genetic, 70% of genetic rare disease start in childhood. Now, people don't have the access to care or there are, there are other things in their life that are impacting their ability to access care, or if they're facing, for example, discrimination as a result of living with a disease, that has an impact on their stress levels, as an impact on their uh, cardiovascular condition uh, and their mental health, you know, which has an impact on uh, managing that condition. So there is, you can see, in health systems designed for common conditions, patients face inequities in accessing diagnosis, care, and treatment, but then they also face compounded impact because they may not have um, a safe and healthy housing environment. Um, They may be isolated. They may not have the food um, needed to to help support the health um, in light of the rare conditions they may have uh, and, and go down the line. You know, so broadband and digital is another one. And then I think that under discussed issue is health literacy and helping, mm-hmm. you know, people understand what's being asked of them or, or resources they can access or the condition uh, and actions that they can take. Um, I think it's really important. It's, you know, with, with communities, it's not a one size fits all when it comes to communication of health conditions and treatment on uh, the implications, but you have to meet people where they're at. I absolutely agree with everything that you said. I think, you know, it's so important that everyone understands what you said about the the social drivers and the importance of that. And the fact that, like you said, 80% of the outcomes are due to these social drivers because historically in medicine and in healthcare, we have focused our time, energy, effort, and resources on the clinical care. And so when we have... um, outcomes and and whether it's disparate outcomes, poor outcomes across the board, the knee-jerk reaction is to look at the clinical algorithms, to look at the clinical care. And, you know, we are just now, I think, coming into this era where there's an increased appreciation for the impact of social drivers and even some mandates, you know, where uh, we are having to ask in, in those clinical settings about all of those things that you mentioned. I also think it's important because Historically, particularly for black and brown individuals and other individuals with marginalized identities, there's been this uh, blame the victim mentality. And I've even, you know, heard it amongst colleagues where, you know, we we look at certain populations, certain communities, we see that they have higher rates of particular disease conditions, poor outcomes. And there was this blaming of, well, if you all just took better care of yourselves, or if you all just cared more about your health. And so this this increasing knowledge that, like you said, this is due to the conditions in which people live, learn, work, and play. Uh, Many of these conditions are um, historically impacted by structural racism and and laws and policies that have had far-reaching implications. And, And also understanding that we can no longer practice healthcare within the confines of the four walls. And so these partnerships that you mentioned are really important 
And I'd love to explore that a little bit further um, because that also has impact on the economics of healthcare. I think as we realize that we have to form these partnerships outside of the Ivy Tower, outside of the hospitals and the health systems and the payers, what are some thoughts that you can share about maybe some specific examples with cross-sector partnerships? I know you already mentioned um, the, the phenomenal model of, of using the barbershop. And I know others have used uh, leveraged hair salons and using hairstylists. What are some other examples that you can share about um, cross-sector partnerships between healthcare organizations and community-based organizations? Yeah, I think this is... Uh, uh... Uh, incredibly important area, and, and I would just agree with uh, all that you shared about, you know, helping um, individuals and supporting them, and not necessarily um, defaulting to uh, the blame. Um, and I, and I, the other thing I would say is, all of what I talked about earlier has, you know, an impact on misdiagnosis, late diagnosis, no diagnosis, and 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 also prevention and screening. So some of the algorithms. Uh, around screening or clinical algorithms have an impact on uh, people not necessarily getting the care they need. Uh, we've seen this with kidney uh, disease around uh, race-based uh, uh, algorithms and, and their ability to get the care they need or transplants. We see this with prevention screening algorithms or other procedures that might be needed. And even with uh, asthma, certain conditions may and, and treatments may not work. As effectively in certain populations um, and uh, we just uh, launched something called illustratechange.com with Deloitte Digital and uh, Johnson & Johnson where less than five percent of uh, medical illustrations are people with darker skin tone so it worked with Chitabari eBay who all shared it some uh, uh, really remarkable images last uh, year that were medical illustrations of a pregnant woman with a black fetus that, that or uh, a black child in utero, and we uh, um, were able to work with him and then support other illustrators of color to get uh, to drive working through 125 digital images across conditions. And this is where, for the rare disease community, uh, and for immunodeficiency, it certainly can be uh, an impactful thing. Now, to the question about collaboration, I think that there needs to be uh, focus and prioritization around the intersection between healthcare organizations, public health, and community-based organizations. And you know, we have levers through the Affordable Care Act and others that have emerged since then to try to put it together, but it's just not happening at the level of scale uh, and investment uh, that we needed to, to get to the outcomes that we want across populations. Um, and so faith-based communities, you know, are important. Employers uh, can play a certain role. As I said, we a recent report shows that you can get 20 years more of health span, uh, not lifespan, means um, more life with poor quality of life versus health. Um, so more life with health and higher quality of life. And know that um, settings, messages, um, roles that various stakeholders, including employers can play can help move the dial um, on that. Uh, and so I'd say that um, value-based care and the ways that community-based organizations are incentivized and supported in that can have an impact on uh, equity outcomes, uh, efficiency. And so, you know, there's some literature around value-based health care as it relates to rare diseases, um, that uh, the there's an equity dimension that embraces a cultural framework uh, associated with concepts of health and, and conditions. So um, a prevention and uh, recovery view and, and help people access the care they need in the continuum is important. Now, community-based organizations need uh, support, they need financial resources, they need training, and you've got to have a high-performing community-based network. And we're seeing some health systems right do this uh, with other organizations and with technology uh, services to screen, refer, and navigate through, through social needs. Um, the other thing I would say is supporting um, uh, using tax incentives and and cities and counties and states uh, to be able to uh, support connection to community-based services and investing in them, whether it's housing or access to food or transportation. Um, I would say uh, 
the other areas using data uh, effectively and, and to identify places of action uh, and, and can you predict and, and get in front of uh, issues that may emerge down the road and can identify needs that um, the community-based organizations can serve uh, along with health systems and public health. So I think we're seeing, you know, the CDC Foundation, Academy Health, um, Kaiser, Kaiser, and a number of others um, that are uh, the associations in healthcare that are catalyzing a, a activity in this area. Um, so I think um, we've got to create, continue to create the systems and structures, you know, that support collaboration. Um, and we'd say that health equity isn't uh, a side gig. You know that it's got to be incorporated into the strategy operations financial work of an organization and the community um, and one example we're seeing is uh, of a holistic approach you know is through uh west side united you know as both a system and community strategy that rush along with bml hair spending uh, and with um, supporting uh, entrepreneurial activity by people that live in the community to support the needs of uh, organizations uh, in a geography to address the life expectancy gap. Um, so the West Side United is a regional racial health equity collaborative that's aligned with city's public health plan and added adaptation of health equity strategy. So that's a, a good example, you know, where you've seen the ecosystem come together locally. We're doing this in Philadelphia through the, our work with Deloitte and the Health Equity Institute. We're bringing private and public sector players together, including uh, around the rare disease community. Community health needs assessment should be intelligence for a community health strategy um, and not a checkbox. And we're seeing also regulatory headwinds address health equity from the Joint Commission to National Committee on Quality Accreditation to Department of Health and Human Services, you know, from a, a, a discrimination standpoint and other areas as well from CMS uh, standpoint. So I think, um, you know, we'll continue to see these headwinds advance. Yeah, I, thank you. And I appreciate you mentioning the, the regulatory environment, because I, you know, I hate to say it, but I think that's really what it's going to take for us to really see continued uh, innovation and, and, and impact and action in this area is to make it where it, uh, health systems don't have a choice. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that that's, and so I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating a lot more activity in this area. You, you mentioned earlier, and I just want to highlight it for our audience um, in terms of the cost of Late diagnosis, no diagnosis, and that's something that's really of importance for the rare disease community and specifically those with primary immunodeficiencies where it can take eight to 10 plus years to get a diagnosis in general. And of course, if you look at individuals uh, who belong to marginalized communities and populations, we know that those diagnostic delays can be even longer. We know that there are um, disparities in access to treatment disparities in provision of appropriate treatment for individuals with primary immunodeficiency. You know, we see the same things mirrored in some of the statistics that you mentioned for um, things like cardiovascular disease and cancer. So I just wanted to highlight that. I think as we prepare to close, Dr. Bott, one thing that has baffled me is that you've very well outlined and it's outlined in Deloitte's report, the huge financial implications to not addressing health inequities. And yet here we are in 2023, you know, and every time I see a new report, whether it's on maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, infant mortality, cardiovascular disease, the disparity gaps actually continue to widen. And so my question for you is why do you think despite the moral imperative, despite the data that we have about these disparities, about excess deaths, uh, despite the information that we have about how to begin to close these disparity gaps, that there still is not enough um, investment, honestly, in health equity efforts. And in fact, we hear that in some institutions, um, individuals who were hired two or three years ago after George Floyd's murder in the health equity space, in the DEI space, are actually those positions are being eliminated. So what, what do you have to say, I guess, like to health systems, uh, hospitals, payers, in terms of what they can and should be doing now to address this problem? 
Yeah, I, I would say, you know, that the, the current environment um, is certainly one that, uh, that should um, reinforce the notion that we've got to double down with equity, that, you know, we're seeing a decline in life expectancy, um, but we're also offering a path forward. There are places where there are bright spots from, you know, Blue Zones to West Side United to other places where even in Chicago, in my own community, we've seen the breast cancer disparities gap close uh, to smaller levels. We've seen uh, in other places where um, the gap around medication uh, engagement uh, across populations for key medications and key conditions are, uh, have, are closing. We've seen the differences between men and women uh, who have uh, uh, diabetes readmission levels at different uh, places uh, that gap close. So I, I would say that one, we know this is a challenge. We we don't need to spend more uh, time necessarily documenting challenges that are already documented. Um, there may be different angles that illuminate um, interventions and actions. What we need to do is um, study the things that are being tested, scaling the things that work, uh, and having accountability and key metrics that are consistent. Um, because I think part of the challenge is work is hard. Um, it's uh, also, uh, I think, we're not necessarily leveraging the things we already know how to do well as healthcare organizations uh, to the scale that we need. So quality and safety, we can put an equity lens on that. Uh, can be done. Our uh, approach to um, operations and financial metrics, you know, how we're collecting data, how we're engaging around um, cultural sensitivity, and building um, trust and, and providing services. So in our paper, we talked about actions that organizations can take, one being intentional, and that means having a strategy, having accountability, having metrics, forming the collaborations needed to deliver on them, measuring progress, you can't improve what you don't measure, addressing individual and community level barriers. And then one that's uh, really hard is trust across the system from individual to healthcare providers to the community um, and in data, uh, uh, as well. And so that building and sustaining trust uh, underpins also progress um, to advance us forward. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, uh, again, health equity is everyone's business. There's certainly an economic case. Uh, there is a moral imperative. Uh, and I think we just got to continue to lean into that and um, build on, uh, on what's working and, and scale um, those interventions. And uh, test new ones to address gaps uh, that we see. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bott. The, the, you said so many things that resonate, but I think what I will remember the most is you said that health equity is everyone's business. And you said that health equity is not a side gig. And, and that just really highlights the importance of uh, really applying a, an equity lens to everything that we do in, in healthcare. And like you just said, you know, imp implementing it and embedding it as part of our quality and patient safety efforts, as part of our financial metrics. And I love that you talked about accountability because I do believe that we are at a crossroads where we we have to be held accountable for uh, the outcomes. And I also love that you shared the bright lights. And there's so many examples of individuals who are doing the hard work, getting good results, closing the disparity gaps. So I just want to thank you again for your time. Thank you for all of the work that you are doing with Deloitte, for all of the work that you've done um, inside and outside of your current position, and just for your advocacy efforts around um, dismantling health inequities and all of the systems that have led to uh, the disparities that we see. So I wish you uh, continued luck and success in all of the work that you do. And thank you so much for being a guest on Bold Conversations. Thank you so much, Dr. Rochester. Uh, again, really appreciate all the work you and uh, your team uh, are doing and the, and the leaders and uh, caregivers in this space around uh, immunodeficiency and, and rare diseases. And, and uh, just uh, we look forward to continuing to be a collaborator and help uh, collectively advance the health equity uh, agenda. It's gonna take all of us, so thanks so much. Absolutely. And where can our listeners find you, Dr. Bad? If they want to read more yeah. about you or the work that's going on uh, with sure. Deloitte, where can they find you? Thank you for that question. I would encourage uh, 
uh, your listeners to search the Deloitte Center for Health Solutions and the Deloitte Health Equity Institute. All that we do in terms of our products, uh, our tools, we have a date, several data dashboards around health equity and maternal health, as well as our research products are available there. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Hungra J, B H A N G R A J A Y, and on Instagram at Dr. Uh, TRJ Bot uh, and uh, uh, on LinkedIn. So happy to have you all reach out and uh, connect. Wonderful. Thank you again. And thank you to all of you for listening to this episode of Bold Conversations. We look forward to joining you next time.